if you want to blame it on something, is socialism. Because America has been a socialist nation for a lot of years, 100 years. We've been moving steadily more and more towards socialism. We certainly were by 1933. By 1933, we had entered into the same agreement that the Israelites entered into with Pharaoh, that a portion of their labor would now belong to the government. And, unfortunately for us, Joseph didn't make the deal. Joseph put a ceiling limit on it. No more than 20% of your labor could be taken away from you. Of course, through crafts of state, they started putting 20% labor on you if you had a child. If you had a child, you had to give 20% labor. Your wife had to give 20% labor. And now you had to give another 20% labor for your child. Actually, they didn't necessarily do 20%, but they increased it because you had a child. Because now that child would take a portion of any benefit that came from the government. You know, like child care and quick programs and all that stuff. And so the taxes went up because there was another child there. It was a graduated income tax in Egypt. Very complex taxing system. They did the same thing in Rome. The tax system in Rome was so complex, they still haven't figured that all out. Of course, some people don't think they figured the IRS tax system out. But it's basically a contract. If you take the benefit, you owe the disadvantage of that membership that allows you to take the benefit. They had a temple to keep track of who was a member and who was not. And they did the same thing over in Israel, Judea, as it was called at that time, in the you registered at the temple and then a portion of everything you produced in a given year had to go to the temple. And the temple used it to redistribute wealth to the needy of society. But of course, they controlled how they did that and it's very clear from the archaeological digs in Judea that at that particular time, the high priests and the priests that ran the temple, which was the welfare system of the nation, centralized system at that time, they lived more opulently than King Herod. And King Herod lived pretty opulently. But it was because they had a huge filled treasury with the contributions of the people. If you produced uh, 100 sheep, they were going to get 20 of them. They didn't have to do any work. They didn't have to feed them. They didn't have to watch them at night. They were going to get 20 of them. They could sell them and put the money in the treasury. They could hire a shepherd at minimum wage. And he could produce more sheep because they had lands tax-free. Lands in common. The Levites had those lands. So the priests got richer and richer and richer. And of course, there was a great welfare system. And of course, Rome came along, invited in by people like Aristobulus and Hyrcanus, John Hyrcanus. Aristobulus invited them, but Hyrcanus actually did take an advantage from them being there because the dispute was over who was to be king. The point is, by this time, Rome was becoming more and more socialist. They had started 150 years before the birth of Christ. That's why Polybius was writing that the masses, he called them, had an appetite for benefits in the habit of receiving them by the rule of force. And of course, John the Baptist said the same thing. We weren't to be like the governments of the world. We were to repent of that thinking that Polybius was talking about. And we were to start to take care of one another through charity. And they said, well, what does that look like? Well, if you have two coats and your neighbor has none, you share your coat. You do the same in meats. You do the same in anything you have. You share it with others. Well, how do you do that? Well, they didn't ask that question in the Bible because they already knew. Because all these people that were listening to John the Baptist were already organized in synagogues. And synagogues were ten families. That's what a synagogue was, ten families. It wasn't a building. It was ten families. The small, intimate home church that the home church people always talk about. But it wasn't just home churches. It was home churches that picked a minister and that minister, his congregation that he was in was not the congregation he served. The congregation he served was the 10 people who picked him. He was the 11th man and he had to pick a minister of his own. And he did. And that made 12 men. This is how the Essenes organized. And the Essenes included Levites and included Israelites or Judeans. And they gathered in this ten families, picked a minister, the eleventh man. The eleventh man picked a minister, and that was twelve men. Now, the interesting thing is that the eleventh man gathered together with nine other men, like himself, who were ministers of congregations of ten. And the way we knew they were gathered together is they all picked the same minister. So that twelfth man in the one congregation was also the twelfth man in the next congregation and the next congregation, and the next congregation. But what that did was that 12th man connected all 100 families. It also connected all 10 families of those ministers who were the 11th man. And so that was 110 families that were connected. 
And then, of course, there was that 12th minister. He gathered with nine other ministers like himself. And that made 120 families. Holy smokes, there was 120 people in the upper room. When they say people, they're talking heads of families. And you say, how do you know that? Well, that's the way they talked in those days. How do we know that? Well, look, they had 5,000 men out there in the countryside before the loaves and fishes. Those 5,000 men, it says, 5,000 men and their families. That's how they counted who was there. They counted them by the family unit. And why is that so surprising? Because Jesus already told you family unit was a unit. It wasn't two people, a husband and a wife. That's not two people. That's a unit. That's a family. That's one thing. And you belong to that family. The wife belonged to the husband, and the husband, in a way, belonged to the wife. And the children belonged to them both. And they spent their life taking care of those children, but they also had to care about their neighbor as much as they cared about themselves. Moses said that. Jesus said that. Abraham even said that. And that's the kingdom of God. Are you seeking to be that? Or are you just going to church to feel good because you get an emotional high when you're with a bunch of people that all say that they're saved? And I'll talk about Jesus and I'll talk about being nice and loving one another. But if you need anything, if you need any welfare, if you need any Medicare or Medicaid or Social Security or any of those things, you go to men who exercise authority one over the other and you get your benefits from them and they own you. You're back in the bondage of Egypt. You get your free bread from Pharaoh and from Caesar and from Cain and from Lamech and from Nimrod because you're back in Babylon. Christ was trying to show you how the kingdom of God works. It works with you having all the choices the God of nature wanted you to have to begin with. Making those choices. You know, rights are responsibilities. Duties are obligations. You have the right to make a choice. You have a responsibility to make it. And you should not be giving that choice to others. And we show you how this is set up in the book Free Church Report, which is free online. I'm telling you what Christ said to do. Sit down in the tens, hundreds, and thousands and start learning what it means to care about your neighbor as much as you care about yourself. Start gathering together in the name of Christ. In other words, you gather to serve others. Well, you have to have others to serve. You can't just gather by yourself. If you continue in the ways of vanity, it bars all hope for you. All hope of redemption. What is redemption? You know, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. His people, but are you his people? Are you doing what he says? Are you coming in his name? Are you gathering together to love one another in faith, hope, and charity? Or are you just gathering together to get an emotional feeling of self-righteousness? Jesus was the highest son of David and the redeemer of the nation of Israel. He came to set the captive free and those who would repent and seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's who he was setting free. He's not setting free those who just say, Lord, Lord, but those who do with the will of the Father. These people were doers of the word. Corbin was making the word of God to none effect. Corbin was the social security system of Judea. And they had Corbin in the temple at Jerusalem, but they also had Corbin at the temple of Roma. Both built by Herod, both providing benefits if you registered, but you would have to pay in. And they would pace off your fields and they would look at what you brought in for fish and they would look at your books and you would have to give your share. And if they thought you were cheating, they would try you and force you to give what your share was or cast you out. Well, Christ was king and now they were giving to Christ and they were giving to the ministers of Christ and it was not being filtered through the treasury. Actually, the word Corbin is even translated treasury in the same Bible, one place. But the money wasn't going to there, so they had to kill Christ. They had to make him not the leader. They had to impeach the Lord. And all those people who got the baptism of Christ were cast out of that system. Of course, now they had to set up that daily ministration right away and start taking care of the needy of their society. But these people that were redeemed were following a different way than the people of the world today. And there's a definition for redemption. Redemption is the deliverance from the power of an alien dominion and the enjoyment of the resulting freedom. It involves the idea of restoration to one who possesses a more fundamental right of interest. 
The best example of redemption in the Old Testament was the deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage from the dominion of the alien power of Egypt. Well, like I said at the beginning of the show, a good place to end is you're back in the bondage of Egypt. You want to be delivered? Christ was showing you the way and gave you the keys to the kingdom. 